So this is going to be the last lecture in the series. And um, I will talk about uh, something that's really, really interesting in, in Haskell, in, in Haskell's concurrency that hasn't been really successful much outside of Haskell. Maybe Clojure has some version of it. And uh, the software transactional memory. Software transactional memory is reasonably easy to implement in Haskell and was like implemented very quickly and it worked. Uh, and it's reasonably uh, fast and efficient. Whereas in uh, imperative languages, it's been a, an uphill struggle. And I'll explain why it's so bad in imperative languages and why it's so sweet in Haskell. The problem that um, SDM, Software Transactional Memory, is trying to solve is the problem of deadlocks. I already mentioned that you know, MVARs, when they are used just like locks and you have more than one MVAR, there is nothing that protects you from deadlocks. Okay, and I'll give you an example how you can create a deadlock in um, using MVARs. But the main reason, the, the like theoretical reason or uh, abstract reason why we have deadlocks when we are using locks is that locks don't compose. Okay? As long as you have just one lock, that's fine. You want to compose two locks. You want to have a system in which you have two subsystems, each with a lock. You try to compose them, it doesn't work. You have to do something that either decapsulates your, your subsystem and you just like, have to have direct <coughs> access in the entrails of your subsystem to grab the lock, right? Or you run into the locks. This is just the... the sickness of the locking system. And um, STM solves this problem. STM produces something that works like locks, uh, but it's composable. It's not as efficient as handcrafted locks, but it's much faster to write, and, and you have the guarantee that you won't have a dead lock. So I think it's a, it's a price that's really worth paying in many, many cases because deadlocks are extremely hard to detect. So let me show you, um, this is not from the book, but this is like this traditional uh, example, uh, the simplest example of deadlocks um, when you have bank accounts the model of bank accounts. That's, that's like, so let's, let's just write an, uh, a data structure for account. So totally simplified. So let's say, let's call it account. And it has a constructor, account. I don't know how to abbreviate this. So and it just has an MVAR with I don't know, int, that will be the balance of the account, sum of money, okay? It's just in dollars, no cents. Um, so it's protected, so, so we can use it in, in, in a multi-threaded environment, right? Just using this, this idea of shared data. So now I will actually implement how to do shared data using MVARs. Okay? Just, just what I, whatever I described before, how to access this data. Um, I'll show you how to do this in detail. So withdraw. We are withdrawing from the account. Uh, so we are passing it an account from which to withdraw, so we'll just pattern match it. Account, what do I call it, MV, right? And we want some, to withdraw some sum. So we start the do block, right? Because this is 
the IO monad. We are doing this inside IO monad because we are using M bars. So we read the balance. Not bad, bad. Okay. You you take M bar and V. Okay? At this point we did two things atomically. We locked the M bar because now it's empty. So anybody who wants to take will block. And we got the value out. Two things atomically. And now we put this modified value back. Put M bar. And what do we put? Oh, we, we put it inside MV. And we'll just subtract val uh, minus, balance minus sum. Okay, I'm assuming that we have infinite credit. <laughs> right? It's a very simplified model. Maybe it kills just blocks. Right, so what happens is that we have locked this by, by calling tag. Now it's empty. Now we do a put and it's full again. So everybody who calls take and var will be unblocked at this point. And they, they can access the account, but they cannot see anything. So this is nice. And, uh, and so this is something that modifies the modifier. And there is something that just takes, gives you a balance, so a reader function. In order to get a balance that's in the account MV, right, to get a balance, we have to do a do loop. And what do we do? Uh, well, we again read the balance, right, and lock it at the same time. Right? So take M bar MV. So notice both. These functions start with take. So they cannot both succeed. If they are called at the same time. One of them will block. And wait for the other to finish. So that's our locking mechanism. Now we got the balance. <coughs> and what we can do is we, we can immediately put it back so that we don't waste our time, right? Just put it back. And bar. And do it. Because we are not modifying, and we immediately unlock it. So we just locked it for a moment to get the, the value, and then unlock it, and everybody else can, can use it. Now we have the balance, and we can return it. Right? By return, we put it in the I.O. monad again. Okay? Very simple implementation. Withdraw, balance. So that's... The share, the data here is just one integer. Okay, so that's a very simple. What what, what um, Simon implements is a little bit more complicated example in which he has these desktops with windows and he moves windows, adds windows to desktops and so on. But this is you know, simpler, simpler but much less practical. So this is all fine and great. But now we want to compose things. Now we want to have multiple accounts. So it still works, you know, as long as you just withdraw from an account and, and read balance from, from an account, it's fine, it's, it's, it's locked. But we want to transfer money between accounts. Right? How hard it is, you know, we just withdraw and put it back, right? I didn't write the function deposit because we can just call withdraw with, with a negative number. Okay? <laughs> I'm dead lazy. <laughs> so the, the first approach to it is um, inside up for your bank. <laughs> transfer. We give it two accounts, right? Uh, a1, A2, these two accounts, and the sum that we want to transfer, and it equals do, and inside the do, we will withdraw A1 sum, 
and withdraw A to negative sign. Okay, so we deposit it in the second. Now, what's wrong with this implementation? Well, on the surface, there isn't really nothing too wrong about it. Um, it could sit there forever. Um, mm, can it sit there forever? Because you are taking a lock for a moment, just withdrawing, and then are, you are taking a lock on another account, just withdrawing. Yeah, there's no guarantee that withdraw will return enough at no time. Well, I have implemented withdraw. I mean, it doesn't do much. Right? Oh, oh, you you're saying it's it's not fair. Like if a lot of guys start with transferring at the same time, that that they 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 there instance. will be some starvation. Well, but yeah, okay. Um, but this is a fair system, right? The, the scheduling fair, so they eventually all will get this this lock, right? Because they will just queue to get this lock, and they will be. So isn't there an, an analog of a deadlock where? Um, not in this implementation. In, in this implementation, there is actually no deadlock. The problem with this implementation is that these are two separate atomic actions. Right. Yeah. <coughs> and if you have any kind of invariant in your back, you will create a state in between these two where this invariant can be broken. For instance, you know, you, you withdraw all the money from this first account, but you haven't deposited yet in the second account. And suddenly, this guy who owns these two accounts has, for a moment, zero money. Okay? That's bad. He goes to a store and says, oh, try this credit card. Refuse. Okay, then try this one. <laughs> also refuse. Okay? Uh, <laughs> That's not a good situation. Okay, this is a very simplified model, but, but you see what the problem could be. There could be invariants of higher order that are broken by, by, by this kind of naive implementation. What you really want is, is, you know, to, during the transfer, you want to keep both locks, Correct. right? So this other implementation, and I would like to really keep some stuff around for the next round. So I don't know if this will be visible. Transfer. Well, this is a bigger thing. Okay, so I'm gonna write it here. The implementation that preserves external invariant. So we have two accounts. Uh, MV1. So I'm pattern matching here. Here I didn't have to because I just passed it directly to withdraw. But here I want to do it uh, explicitly. So I have two accounts, MV1, MV2, and the sum equals do. Right? And now uh, I want to get the balance of the first one. Balance, let's say balance one from take M take m bar, there's a lot of typing here on the whiteboard, uh, mv1 sum, no, sorry, just take the balance, right? So balance 2, mv2, right? I'm just skipping this stuff. Um, so now both accounts are locked because I took from both of them. They are both locked. Now I can unlock them one after another. So I put the M bar. Balance one minus sum. And here, balance two. Okay, MV1, MV2. MV2. Balance two. Plus sum. Okay. 
So that looks good now, right? There is no point in time when uh, money has disappeared. Is that true? Well, there's only a point where you can't query whether the money is Right, right. So, so somebody else who's doing something like this will block. Right? But they cannot read two of these accounts at the same time and see that the sum is zero. That possibility is not here. Because we are taking two locks and then, there are the, then we are doing the calculation, right? And then we are putting back. Unlocking, yes? But if you do two transfers with the same account in opposite directions. Exactly. Okay, so you've seen this, right? No. I've no? This here. <laughs> no. Everybody who did a little bit of locking, uh, programming with locks, <laughs> knows that this is even worse than this one. Okay, this one causes, causes some inconsistency of, of external um, constraints, but but this one is really, really bad, okay? Because if somebody else at the same time calls transfer from account two to one in the opposite direction, then what happens is they are taking these two locks in the opposite order. So imagine that the first one takes the first lock and the second one takes the second lock because they are transferring in the opposite direction, right? And then this guy says, I want to take the second lock. I have first lock, I want to take the second lock. And this guy says, I have the second lock, I want to take the first lock, right? And they are blocked. Nobody will move back and say, okay, you, you sir first, right? <laughs> no, you sir first. Right? No, they will block forever and that's the real deadlock, that's like the minimum deadlock situation, right? This is why people say locks don't compose, because either you create a, a weird situation like this, or you create a possibility of deadlock. And of course, you know, people who write databases and, and these, you know, locking systems and so on, they have a solution for this. This is like a, you know, really... Uh, sort of solution that you have to think about how you are implementing this and constantly watch what you're doing, right? The solution to this problem is to always take these logs in the same order. So you have some global order of all the logs that you are taking in a particular uh, situation, right? And every API the, every access to your bank has to know about this protocol, okay? You number them, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you have always to take the, you know, the locks in the right order, and so on. And, and of course, this, this solution has been known for a long time, and still there are deadlocks. So obviously this solution uh, doesn't work with humans. Right? Who write the code. So, the people who came up with the solution for, to, to this problem, like how to avoid dead loss, are the database people. Okay? Because what they say is, okay, we want to do these two actions, and we want to sort of do them atomically. So, either we are here before it, or we are here after it. Anything that happens in between is invisible to the rest of the world. And they call it a transaction. So you can do multiple operations on your database within a single transaction. And this transaction performs these things, and what does it do? It logs them. So every operation that is supposed to happen inside the transaction is logged. Every read of a table, every write to a table is logged. Now with reads, we just log that we read something. With writes, okay, the simplest implementation is don't do the actual write at this point. Put it in the log with the value that you want to put there. Okay? 
So do it virtually. Because once you modify the database, everybody else sees your modification. That's bad. You cannot say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. Too late. Okay? So you have to prepare all these, you have to do all these reads, you have to prepare all these, all these writes, and then at the end of the transaction, you commit the transaction. Okay? You, you try to commit a transaction. And the thing that you have to do is verify all these reads so that the values hasn't, haven't changed because some other transaction committed before you and they just changed the values that you were reading. So you have to verify that your reads were correct, right? And if they were, then you can start writing the stuff back to the database. And you have to do this atomic. This part you have to do atomic. Okay. Does that mean you take the lot? Um, there are very clever ways of doing this with minimum lock taking. Okay, uh, and I'm not going into the implementation of of STM, but STM um, has these locks that are just like single bit locks and locks all the memory locations that were that are to be written by changing this bit in some you know atomic operation and so on so this is like highly optimized lock free implementation but even with, with the database when you said you have to after you did all the reads you have to double check nobody else did that does uh -huh. that have to be atomic as well again Actually, you don't have to, but the, to explain why you don't have to lock the locations that you are reading is a um, very complex explanation. <laughs> yeah. But, but what you have to know is that this has to be optimized highly and some c really, really clever people thought about it a lot and they proved the algorithm is correct, and then they implement it, and they tested it very, very well, and so on. And it's been done once and for all, for all of us to use, okay? So as a programmer, when I'm using database, I don't have to worry. I'm just saying, open transaction, do this, 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 close the transaction. And of course, the transaction may abort because of interference from other transactions, but um, you, we take this optimistic view, you know, that in most cases nobody cares, nobody will interfere with us, we are the only guys doing this particular sequence of operations, right? And only rarely it will happen that some other transaction goes and, and screws the data and then we have to like, abort the transaction or maybe retry the transaction, right? And is that choice of aborting or retrying, is that automatic or... Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to talk more about databases. I can tell you that this exactly mechanism, not exactly, but this mechanism is the basis of STM. And in STM's implementation, things are retried. Unless you explicitly want to abort from the inside of the transaction, <coughs> If you don't do that, then the transaction will be retried until it succeeds. Okay. So generally, it's something you don't have to pay attention yes, to. Yes, yes. You don't have to pay attention. You don't have to explicitly say loop around until right. it comes. No. That's, that's assumed. So STM is the implementation of this procedure, but in memory. So I don't know. Are, are there, uh, is, is there anybody who does a little bit of database programming. Just a little bit, right? They have this, this uh, acronym, ACID. Have you heard of ACID? Atomicity. Consistency. Consistency. Isolation. Isolation. Durability. Durability. <laughs> okay? So, atomicity means that the transaction either finishes or not, but it's done atomically. So anybody from, you know, it's, it is like if you would 
Like the simplest thing of thinking about is, let's have a global lock. And every transaction tries to grab this global lock and does its stuff. Nobody else has access to our database in the meanwhile. We are finished with the transaction, we release this lock, and next transaction can start. SQLite actually that works like that, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> okay, this is really, really bad in implementation. So people have come up with ways of running these transactions in parallel and from time to time having to abort and retry it, right? So atomicity means just having this one global, mental global lock, right? Uh, consistency means that nobody will see ever this undefined state in between, this temporary state that was created before we finish the transaction. Because during the transaction, you know, the state of the database can be inconsistent. Like there can be some invariant that were broken because we haven't finished yet, right? Like here, right? We took the money, but we haven't put it back, right? We just ran with this money, did, did some shopping. So, um, what was I? Isolation. Isolation, right. So isolation means that this is totally isolated from all the other transactions that are going on, that they don't interact with each other. Well, in STM this is not actually true because we have to verify these reads, right? So while we are performing other, uh, this transaction, another transaction can commit and then we have to retry. But we assume that, you know, like we always, always see a consistent state of the database. This is actually a little problem in STM, uh, that sometimes you, your reads might be inconsistent. And, this, and, in, uh, and this is one of the problems that, that is really bad in imperative languages. Right? The, seeing inconsistent state. Is that like a leak extraction, or are we fine? No, no. So the thing is that if you see an inconsistent state and you perform the transaction, you eventually find out that it was inconsistent, right? And you just abort and return, right? So that's not the problem. The problem is that if you have inconsistent data and you are performing some code, based on inconsistent data, then this code can explode, okay? Simply explode, because it never expected to see inconsistent data, right? It's reading from the database data that, that does not fulfill some global invariance, right? But it's still just like an exception that's contained, right? You can't do either. No, but it can go into an infinite loop, for instance. And then it's not contained. But there are ways to protect yourself from that. They are implemented in ST. Okay. So now, let me introduce STM. Okay? It's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's not much more complex than what I had before. Right? So, um, so just like we had um, um, We have to have a monad, right? So this time the monad is not IO, it's called the STN monad, okay? And we have actions inside of this monad. So, so we define data type STN, no, not we define, sorry. It's defined for us, okay? So this is an abstract data type, STN of A type constructor that takes any type and puts it into STM mode. And this is a monad, so, so this is an instance, instance monad STM, okay? And there's some implementation that's hidden from, from our review, but abstractly speaking, monad, STM type constructor without A, right? STM is the type constructor, that's a monad. So we can actually write do blocks inside STM monad. And it will create these STM actions. 
just like we have IO actions, we have SDN actions. Okay? So, so because it, it, it's a monad, we can, we can create these uh, uh, STM actions and combine them, right? Because we can use bind, right? And you can, we can encapsulate some values into STM monad by using return. So we have this power of splitting things, and this is actually, the, you know, the idea of, of being able to compose things, right? We are inside the monad, we compose things. So we can compose these little um, STM actions into bigger STM actions. And that's what we do inside the STM. I'll show you how it's done in, in a practical example. Actually, in this example, I'll show you. So now, if we want to get out of the STM monad, finally, so we, we have created this STM action, but it doesn't do anything. It's just a recipe for doing something, just like an IO action, right? It's a recipe to do something. Now we want to execute it, right? So to execute an STM action, we have this function called atomically. So it's a very good name. It says, do this stuff atomically, right? In one go. So that introduces a transaction. And atomically takes an STM action that we have uh, created, right? Com combining some other actions, mm -hmm. and produce an IO, right? Because once it performs the action, it actually, this action interacts with the external world, with other threads. Because there is communication. Now I, now I have to talk about communication, right? So how do these things communicate between threads? So instead of M vars, we will be using T vars, transactional variables. So they, are, they correspond to our M vars. They are very similar. So we have data T var, abstract data type, A. Okay. What do they correspond implementation wise? They correspond to these locations that are mutable, that are shared between threads, into which we can write stuff and read stuff. <coughs> but every time you read something from it, it's being logged, okay, in this transaction log. Every time we write into this, the write actually is logged but not performed. It will be performed only when we call atomic. This is what, when all these writes are performed, okay? So this is like, okay, we can read stuff from memory from Shared memory, M vars represent, I mean, T vars represent this shared memory, but it's not uh, available for mutation. Like M var was actually mutating the stuff. T var is not directly mutating the stuff, it's just logging. Mutated later, okay? And this mutation is performed inside atomically at the end of the transaction. So where the atomically block ends, this is when the transaction commits, and then when this uh, reads are verified and writes are performed. And this is why it's an I.O. action. So, okay. so, so the re reason for doing the, the reads and then verifying them is just so that, for, as a programming convenience, so that you can know what the state of things are before you try to write them? No, no. The thing is that when you are reading, let's like, say so you're performing your transaction, right? Yeah. And you are reading this location, this T var. You are reading another T var and another T var. You know, you can be reading multiple T vars in, inside <coughs> the same you're transaction. You're going to read them all over again anyway. If you abort. When you, when you commit. When yes. You commit, you yes. Have when you commit, you, you have to compare. read them again and compare with what you've read before. Yeah, so, so it's a convenience that you read them before. As no, it's not convenience because you use them in your calculations. 
You take these values and you use them. I see, I see. Okay. Right? So you perform some actions using these okay. values, right? Okay. And then at the end, you have to verify because if there was another transaction that committed between your reads, then your reads are inconsistent, right? There were some reads before the transaction and after the transaction. This, mm -hmm. this alien transaction that happened in the middle, right? So at that point, you know you have to abort because you have conflicted with another transaction that was successful in committing, right? This other transaction succeeded, committed, and now you see the result. So you have to retry, okay? So what's the, what's the interface? Well, there is new TVAR, right? Just like we have new MVAR, you have new, new TVAR. And it takes some value A and produces an STM. So it encapsulates inside the STM monad of TVAR A. So it's, it's exactly like before. Before we had IO here. Now we have STM. Before we have MVAR, now we have TVAR. So it's a very analogous to what we did before with MVARs. Now we are doing it with TVARs and with STM monad instead of IO monad. And, and of course there is read and write TVAR. Just like we, before we had put and, 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 and get. The, but these are not blocking. They are just logging. Stop. Well, read is reading from, from the TVAR and logging the read. And write is writing to the log. And that's it. And they, they produce STM actions. So STM A, and this produces STM unit. So, so you're right, this is unit. The, the, the right produces a unit. Okay? So this is the whole interface. So now let me rewrite this stuff. Okay? So account, instead of mvar, will now be a tvar. Okay? Now with draw, well, instead of MV, we'll have TV, right? TV. Okay. Instead of take MVAR, we'll have read TVAR. Right? Non blocking. Instead of put MVAR, we will have write TVAR. So, straightforward transformation, right? Except that this guy now not, doesn't produce an I.O., it produces an STM value, right? Produces STM uh, of integer. And I can I can replace balance with the same the same kind of stuff, right? Now, this is not exactly equivalent to our uh, withdraw previously because withdraw was actually performing the action. Mm -hmm. This guy is not performing. The action. This this is you need atomically in front of it. So you do withdraw, it produces an STM action, then you do atomically on this. Right? And you get an I.O. action. So you have one more step to do. But the thing is that these things that produce STM actions, they can be combined. Right? This is composable stuff. Once you get the atomically, then the thing is, you know, just done. It's done atomically. You can compose these things within the I.O. monad then. Right? But they won't be atomic. They will be just, you know, there will be gaps between them. Things are not locked. So balance, you can also implement the same way. We'll produce STM action, right? 
So it, the, the, the all withdrawn balance is done by doing atomically withdraw, atomically balance. But transfer now is very simple. Right? The transfer will do atomically do withdraw withdraw <laughs> but because I put it inside the atomically block this is a do block that produces an STM action that combines these two STM actions right and this whole thing will be done atomically there is no gap in between if somebody tries to like to read something from these accounts in between, they will have to start their own transaction and they will be competing with our transaction. And one of us will have to retry. Right? If somebody else is, is uh, changing the balance, or withdrawing money from the account, they will conflict with us. And either we will win and they will have to retry, or we will win, we will lose, and we will have to retry. But these are two atomic actions going in parallel. So we have a system that's composable and it guarantees that there will be no deadlocks. Okay? And it doesn't force us to use any locking things, worry about locking and stuff. We just say, do these things atomically, perform a transaction, just like with database. Database programming does, does not worry about deadlocks. And that's because. And on top of this, so, so this is really, really practically used in commercial Haskell. Right, Michael? You write code using STM. Yeah, sure. Yeah? Although, actually, we tend to prefer to invar it because the encourage the code to be simple. Ah, okay. So we, we, if, we, if we're in a situation where we might have deadlocks, it's uh -huh. like, well, why are we in that position in the first place? Right. <laughs> if you know that there will be no deadlocks, then you sign Okay. Right. But that's, that's, could be dangerous a little bit, right? You're playing with fire. <laughs> <laughs> One day you'll get a deadlock. <laughs> And this, this system actually is, is reasonably efficient in Haskell. You know, people are afraid of STM in, uh, in other languages. They, they just think, oh, should we do this? Should we not? You know, there's like, uh, I think the proposal to include STM in C++ has been going on for like, I don't know, <coughs> 10 years or so, and still hasn't gone through. The other thing about a Haskell implementation that imperative languages just can't do is that <clears throat> see if you are redoing a transaction right if, if it failed and you have to retry the transaction if you had anything inside this transaction that cannot be undone you're host right if inside your transaction you shoot intercontinental missiles, <laughs> you know, then you'll shoot them twice. I don't know if it's really <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, we'll destroy the earth twice instead of just once. Right? <laughs> but, but even if you print something or you get jar or something, you know, it's, all these actions are, yeah? So is that where like Haskell has an advantage because you can create your own monad, which creates like a context where you can restrict what's possible. Yeah. I guess it's not really possible in other well, languages. Well, you see, you cannot, I mean, these, these things are side effects, the, the, the missiles and the, and the printing. They are side effects, and they are always have to be encapsulated in the I.O. monad. And the I.O. monad is this, uh, like, uh, you know, die-hard monad. You cannot kill it. Once you do something in, inside the I.O. monad, it will percolate up to the top to main, right? You cannot just say, oh, I'm doing some I.O. inside my STM transaction, right? But then uh, I'm not returning this I.O. action at all. 
okay, if you're not returning it, then you haven't done anything, right? And that's good. But if you want to return the I.O., then you're in trouble. Since like other languages, are, the whole thing is always I.O. basically. Yeah, yeah. Everything is I.O. And at any point in time, you can do I.O. invisibly. You know, there is, it's not, the type system has no idea that you did a bad thing. Or it's so how is it even possible? Like in C++, what's their approach? Like, well, the approach in C++ is that, you know, you have to do testing and then retesting. No, but I'm saying you're saying they're working on the STM proposal. Oh, in STM proposal? Yeah, well, like, testing and testing, you know, you have an STM system, you can use it, but just never, ever try to do input-output inside your transaction, you know. But that's you, you, just, you just get the spanking. You know, that's that's how C plus plus works. You don't do exception and destructive. Yeah. Wait, it's all yeah. like runtime then. Nothing. <laughs> the spanking, right? Like yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and from time to time you will get an error that, that will just so kill, kill your system. But but other otherwise it's undiscovered. Undis There's no amount of testing can can actually guarantee that it's correct. So if, if you guys are interested in how hard it is to put software transactional memory into an object-oriented language, Joe Duffy has a great retrospective on that. Uh -huh. um, he tried to put software transactional memory into C Sharp for many, many years. Joe? Joe Duffy. Um, and he's in charge of the C Sharp team now. Um, and he used to be on an incubation project at Microsoft to get STM into C Sharp that did not end up working. Is um, that the Midori guy? He was in Midori, yeah. Oh, okay. That blog, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, his blog article is called A Brief Retrospective on Transactional Memory, and it's, uh, it's a good overview of it. Right. So, STM essentially failed everywhere except in Haskell and Clojure. I guess. I don't know much about Clojure, but I know that they have STM. But it's a functional language. But it's dynamic. But it's dynamic. So, yeah. so I don't know how it really works. Is it okay or is it late? Okay, so <clears throat> just one more thing about STM. Uh, because STM contains more stuff, okay? It's just amazing stuff. Um, for instance, um, when, when we're in traditional uh, concurrent programming, we have to have conditional variables, right? Like if you want to implement like a consumer, uh, producer consumer queue, you have to like signal things. You have to have conditional variables. If this condition changes, you know, then wake me up and so on, right? Um, in SDM, you don't need any conditional variables. There's just one uh, keyword or function called retry. And that's your way of conditioning your code. So, so how, how does it work? Suppose that you are reading how from... How do you know that the um, atomically failed? Um, how do you know that you just retry? Oh, you never know. It always succeeds. Atomically always succeeds. Internally, it might retry it a few times. But you never know that. As a programmer, you have no idea. No. It always succeeds from your point of view. Okay. And you never observe any <laughs> side effects, so you don't know. So retry. Um, so, so suppose that you are reading from some, from some TVAR, right? And you say, OK, this, is, this, is, this value is not what I like. Okay? Maybe it's just a Boolean, true, false. I need true in order to work, right? And I'm getting false here. So if, if I get true, then I will continue and finish the transaction, right? But if I get false, what, do, what can I do? Well, I can say, uh, OK, well, I cannot proceed. So I will have to retry the transaction and hope that this value changes. 
because it's a T-var. Somebody else can modify it, right? So you put this keyword retry, and at this point the transaction is aborted and retry. Okay. And then you read this T-var again, right? And maybe this time it gives you true, and you're happy you finished, right? If it still gives you false, then you get the retry, you retry again, right? Now, conceptually, this is what happens, right? In practice, that would be horrible, right? You, you, you'd be looping, looping, looping forever. However, because you are doing a transaction, all your reads are logged. So when you hit retry, okay, you know exactly which TVARs you were reading, right? So you are not going to retry this until one of them changes, right? So you put them on some queue, these TVARs that you are waiting for, and you say, notify me, please, wake me up. Okay, I'm going to sleep. Wake me up when one of them changes. And then I will retry the transaction with a change variable. And maybe I'll succeed. Otherwise, I'll retry again. Okay? Until I hit this, this nice state in which... Usually, it's just one T bar. Sometimes it's two. Yeah? I so remember seeing something called or else. Or else, yes. That's, that's another miraculous thing that we can implement <laughs> <laughs> in transactional memory. Or else is you have, uh, you have a condition on in which, um, you know, if... Uh, so how does it work? You try two things, right? You try the first thing, and if it succeeds, then okay, you continue. But if it doesn't succeed, then you try the second possibility, reading some other T bar. Right? And if both of them fail, well, then retry, right? And again, don't retry blindly, because you know which T bars you were reading. So just wait until one of them changes and retry. But you can choose between two possibilities. It's like a building block. Yeah. So I was amazed how easy it was to implement a producer-consumer queue using SDN. It's just amazing. Because I tried implementing this in C++, you know, the, the normal way with logs, condition variables. I always got it wrong. So is that then like T-chan and that? Is that what you use? Or the yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you have to have a buffer, right? You have to have a buffer. You can just have one buffer and, you know, not, that's not really, uh, I don't know. You have to have some T-bars in there that inform you about which queue is, whether the queue is too big or too small. Or array. So this is essentially all the stuff that I wanted to talk about. Uh, there is more in the book, so I, I think right now you are actually ready to read this book and understand the stuff there. There is much more about uh, concurrency and parallelism. There's stuff like async exceptions, and probably Michael would tell us more about it because he's struggling with them every day. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. We found the That's solution. That's what JSON so. Okay. So we'll make a library that takes it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, he he also uh, um, gives an implementation of a, a network server using STM. Very nice. Um, and and he also talks about distributed programming in Haskell. There is this thing called Cloud Haskell that is sort of like Erlang in Haskell, but better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it. That's the end of the whole course. Thank you very much.